A very good morning to you. My name is Hamon Petuarius and I am the Head of Strategic Communications for the Institute of Race Relations, the IRR. Today's webinar will be quite exciting, gearing up for an election year. We are starting to take a look at the in-depth policy offerings, well, as in-depth as they come, of the political parties vying for your vote. Today we will be discussing uh, the paper published today with this webinar as its launch, commissioned by the Institute of Race Relations from Mr. Ivo Fechte. Ivo has a respected history as a columnist, an analyst, an opinion writer, a journalist, and he writes for the IRR's sister publication, The Daily Friend. Without further ado, Ivo, over to you to introduce us to this paper. Thank you, Herman. Um, I came across last year a lengthy document about 5,000 words worth in which the EFF elaborated at considerable length um, about its the, the seven uh, non-negotiable economic pillars that are enshrined in its constitution. Most documents you'll see are not a fairly short, you know, fairly high level. But this was a this this brought a, a lot of great detail, and I thought this is a great opportunity to actually have a look um, at the the sort of political manifesto of the or the economic manifesto of the of the EFF in some detail. The EFF is often caricatured um, in a very one-dimensional manner. Um, yet, if you read through its its uh, seven pillars. It's actually far from shallow, and, and these ideas are rooted in some very real and often justified grievances. So its policy proposals ought to be approached with understanding and fair-mindedness um, as the sincerely held beliefs of a party that's been able to command significant electoral support. Um, the EFF holds that although they have won political freedom, quote, the black people of South Africa still live in absolute mass poverty, are landless. Their children have no productive future, they are mistreated, and they are looked down upon in a sea of wealth. Well, this comment, while fair in some respects, was already an overgeneralization when it was written in 2013. Um, at that time, 24.4% of black South Africans identified as middle class, uh, compared to 29.7% of all South Africans. Um, so there was an imbalance, uh, but it wasn't quite as dramatic as the EFF would, would have us believe. Yet it is true that far too many black South Africans remain mired in poverty and unemployment and remain worse off than their compatriots. This is a very legitimate grievance. It, it's, it's very clear. It's also, uh, it appears in a lot of what, what we at the IRR write and what we, what we try to address uh, at the IRR. The EFS conception of economic freedom is one in which black people, both as a group and individually, enjoy material equality with South Africans of other races and each other. It views such equality or freedom as unachievable under a capitalist regime, but attainable only by means of a socialist revolution. Now, classical liberals, uh, which I am and which the IRR is, uh, would consider a socialist regime in which the state controls the nation's resources and means of production to be, by definition, unfree. The cornerstones of economic freedom, says the Fraser Institute, which is a nonpartisan classical liberal think tank, the cornerstones of personal choice, voluntary exchange, freedom to enter markets and compete, and security of the person and privately owned property. Now, such a definition conflicts fundamentally with what the EFF calls economic freedom. To achieve its objectives, the EFF has laid out these seven non-negotiable cardinal pillars, which are enshrined in its constitution. These are, number one, expropriation of South Africa's land without compensation for equal redistribution. Two, nationalization of mines, banks, and other strategic sectors of the economy without compensation. Three, building state and government capacity, which will lead to abolishment of tenders. Four, free quality education, healthcare, houses, and sanitation. Five, massive protected industrial development to create millions of sustainable jobs, 
including the introduction of minimum wages in order to close the wage, close the wage gap between the rich and the poor. Six, massive development of the African economy and advocating for a more uh, for a move from reconciliation to justice in the entire continent. And seven, open, accountable, corrupt, free government and society without fear of victimization by state agencies. I mean, this is a tall order. Um, this is a, a, a very dramatic wish list. Now, each of these points are, are broken down into, the finer, into finer policy directives laid out in this 5,000 word document that I referred to, entitled The Seven Non-Negotiable Pillars of the EFF, which was first published in 2020. So in this paper that uh, we've just launched, I examine this exposition of the EFF economic platform in detail. I describe how its policies might harm the people of South Africa and how the EFF could achieve its broad objectives if instead it were to adopt a classical liberal path to prosperity for all such as the recently revised third edition of the IRR growth strategy. Now, the EFF correctly points to continuing injustices in South Africa, and in particular, the gulf between the material conditions of the average black person and the average white person in South Africa. The EFF's prescriptions for addressing this inequality are, in its own words, radical, leftist, anti-capitalist, and anti-imperialist. And they're inspired by Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, and Franz Fanon. I, we all know who Marx and Lenin are. Franz Fanon was a prominent anti-colonial thinker who explored the psychological and socio-political dimensions of liberation and decolonization in his works. He argued that colonial oppression not only subjugated nations economically and politically, but also inflicted deep psychological wounds on the colonized. He contended that true liberation required a profound cultural and psychological transformation, emphasizing the need for a radical break from colonial influences. He rejected gradualist approaches and advocated for a violent and decisive struggle against colonial powers, believing that only through forceful resistance could the colonized reclaim their agency and humanity. Its policies, therefore, are inconsistent with the classical liberals' commitment to individual liberty, property rights, free enterprise, and above all, peace. They are inconsistent with South Africa's peaceful transition to democracy. Fanon was a product of his time. He died in 1961 at the height of the decolonization movement at the age of only 36. Yet the EFF still considers him relevant well into the 21st century. On the upside, the EFF has said that it embraces the values of human dignity, equality, human rights and freedoms, those of non-racialism and non-sexism, and open, accountable democracy with universal suffrage. On these principles, classical liberals heartily agree. Uh, Herman. Herman, I'm afraid I can't hear you. My apologies. Uh, I, I got so carried away with that introduction that I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> I must say it is a breath of fresh air to find serious consideration of the philosoph philosophical assumptions of political parties in South Africa, especially one so easily characterized by ordinary South Africans, by many in the press, even us in the think tank sphere, quite often um, miss the wood for the trees and assume that because some of the politicians might be brash, that the ideas underlying that party might in fact be shallow and crass. That is not the case. And I think this paper of yours does reveal that. Now let's delve a bit further into these seven economic pillars, starting with the expropriation of land. What I found without compensation, it should be said, what I found very interesting is that mm, two questions folded into one here. Number one, this mass expropriation of land without compensation you mentioned isn't uncommon. And then you mentioned some examples, our neighbor to the north, Venezuela, and historically 
China under Mao Zedong. What interested me as well in the next point in the paper was the fact that you say this changes what a government is to a bunch of bureaucrats administering these resources. Could you elaborate on why that is a problem or why it is a change from how things are currently done in South Africa? Yeah, the, the real issue is, I mean, look, expropriation um, of land without compensation is not only unjust on the face of it. Um, right, you are taking people's assets that they've worked for and that they that they legitimately own. In most cases, I mean, some of it they don't legitimately own, and there's absolutely a liberal case to be made for um, uh, for, for for land restitution. Um, and I, I have no issues with that whatsoever. If any land was was uh, you know was come by in, in illegal means, was stolen, it should absolutely be returned, or the uh, or the victim should be compensated. Um, but the, the rest of land, which is most of the land in South Africa, um, expropriating that without compensation is not only unjust on the face of it, it's also going to have grave consequences, um, especially for the stability of the financial sector, which has a great deal of debt secured by private property. Um, now, under the EFF, all land will be owned by the state and made available for leases of up to 25 years if the government approves of the use that the lessee will make of the land. Now, this means that land users will be serfs of the government. You cannot build a long-term business or risk capital in developing a property upon the goodwill of government bureaucrats. You know, the, the EFF foresees more than half of the population working the land. They openly call it an agrarian revolution, despite the awful record that such policies have had in the past, especially under Mao in China, um, under Pol Pot in Cambodia. Uh, and under Mugabe in Zimbabwe. Now, d developed economies got rich by reducing the number of people employed in agriculture so that they could be instead employed in industry and in commerce and services and in technology. Uh, the EFF, in fact, with the rich world, uh, most of the rich countries employ between 1 and 3% of their population in agriculture. Um, these, this is uh, much higher, of course, in developing countries where far more people are involved in agriculture. You don't want half your population right, uh, be busy with, with producing the nation's food. You want as few people as possible producing the nation's food so that the rest of the nation can get on with, with more valuable things, more productive uh, efforts. Um, the EFF believes that small-scale farming for a majority of the population is an avenue to prosperity, which is frankly absurd. Now, the IRR, by contrast, uh, in its growth strategy, considers secure property rights to be the cornerstone of a revitalized agriculture sector that can employ more people, produce more food, expand into Africa, and increase export earnings. Now, this agrarian revolution um, that you write about and that the EFF speaks about, is that just a romanticized idea of what it means to be African and perhaps what it means to be an African and a working class citizen. I think it is, and I think it always has been um, among communist thinkers. You know, it's it's it goes back to as far as Rousseau, I guess, with uh, you know his idea of the noble savage. You know that that if everyone works their little plot of land and produces a little bit of excess, it would, you know, everything would be glorious. Um, but it forgets that actually in those situations, in, you know, which, which was all real all around the world in the Middle Ages, um, there were very frequent famines, you know, crops failed, and there was absolutely no buffer for, for dealing with that. Um, so, you know, if you had a bad, a bad summer, a bad harvest, all right, you'd be starving the next winter. Um, this is not an ideal uh, civilization. You know, to, to build. It's, it's a very precarious living. It's not a very prosperous living. Um, prosperity didn't grow at all under this sort of, um, you know, almost feudal uh, mm. land management system um, of the Middle Ages. It only started growing once we started developing technology, started developing the freedoms um, and the political freedoms to go beyond agriculture to go beyond having to spend all our days 
just to make sure that we've got enough food on our tables. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that freed that free people to build steam locomotives and computers and, you know, all the, all the things that we associate with prosperity today. I think one of the most interesting historical uh, effect uh, uh, related to this point is if you look at Europe, um, countries with rivers flowing into the Mediterranean are historically faster developing countries than countries with rivers flowing north into the colder regions of the North Pole. Perhaps an indication that an agrarian society is step one of a civilized society, but it quickly needs to get to the question of trade if it wants to have historical growth. Now, that trade question also comes into your paper because this idea of what the government can and can't do in terms of prescribing the use of land, would that have an implication for something like trade? Well, it would. Um, you know, it would, it would basically control what this country produces. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to that later when, um, when we talk about protectionism. Uh, because that is a that is one of the pillars of of the EFF. So we'll um, we'll revisit that. What I didn't address, and uh, just an interesting point that you raise uh, about the rivers, um, I didn't go deeply into trade with Africa um, because although the the, the EFF um, you know obviously has some ideas that we should be involved in the development of Africa um, and 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 trade with Africa, um, one of the reasons that Africa has fallen behind. Uh, or has been slow to develop um, is because unlike Europe and America, it does not have navigable rivers. So the physical uh, trade with neighboring countries in Africa is difficult. You know, we have mountain ranges and jungles to cross, uh, Sahara deserts to cross. Um, all of Africa is pretty much on a plateau. There are no navigable rivers. So there's no there's no great... Uh, trade routes in that sense, mm -hmm. um, and that that has historically uh, held South Africa back. So held uh, Africa back um, in terms of trade. So you're you're right, and uh, you know if 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 this agrarian revolution idea, this idea that we could all be small scale farmers, or that a large percentage of the population could be small scale farmers, if that led to prosperity, then that would have been true anywhere, including in South Africa, uh, including in Africa. Um, you know, and and. The fact that the fact that the rest of the world got rich on trade and not farming um, really suggests that the that the EFF has got this all wrong. The reason I might have jumped the gun a bit to the protectionist point that comes later is the next point, the next pillar, also speaks to about another level of control. Land uh, expropriation without land or oh, of land without compensation and government control means production of what grows on land becomes the government's responsibility. But then we take the next step to nationalization of mines, banks, and other quote unquote strategic sectors. So that's we're moving on to the next sector of the economy. And again, we see an advocacy for not the decentralized use of these natural resources, but quite clearly an indication that the government, the state, should be the role player in deciding what to do with quote unquote strategic sectors. Yeah, yeah it's uh it, it's it's it would be quite concerning, you know, if if these policies were implemented. Um the EFS vision is of a, a state that controls large parts of the economy, if not all of it. Um you know, I don't think they see a way to 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 reach in all every nook and cranny, but uh, certainly all the large industries, all the significant sectors of the economy, um, the ANC would uh, sorry that the EFF would want to nationalise. Um, uh, notably, they talk about the mines, um, but they also talk about other key industries such as banking. Now, EFF leader Julius Malema was heavily influenced by and very admiring of the late revolutionary leader of Venezuela. Uh, Hugo Chavez, and he has modeled much of his party's economic ideas on those of Chavez. Um, so when we talk about nationalization and the EFS vision for nationalization, it's really sufficient to demonstrate the catastrophic consequences of Chavismo in uh, Venezuela, where fully three quarters of the country's annual output has been destroyed 
and 20% 20 20 of its population has fled. Nationalization in Venezuela, um, just like the EFF's vision, aimed to increase state control and redistribute wealth. Instead, it led to inefficiencies, a decline in productivity and economic instability. Um, the oil industry, Venezuela's largest source of revenue, was decimated as production fell by 85%. The ships of Conferry, the country's largest commercial shipping company, are now scrap metal. From a peak of 479,000 tons in 2007, almost half a million tons, the steel industry in Venezuela dwindled. It produced a negligible 1,000 tons in 2019. The nationalization of agricultural land and fertilizer companies precipitated widespread hunger and starvation and forced people into the kind of hard scrabble subsistence farming that the EFF now touts as an agrarian utopia. After taking over the banking industry, Venezuela entered a hyperinflationary spiral. Between 2016 and 2019, according to official central bank figures, annual inflation averaged 53 million. 798,500 um, percent. I mean, that, it, is, it is inconceivable, you, you, that level of inflation. It's, it basically, the country's money is, is absolutely worth it. By the time you earn it, you already can't afford um, what it's supposed to buy. The nationalized gold mining industry was interesting because it fell under the personal control of Nicolas Maduro, who exploited miners working from dawn to dusk under the brutal lash of a state-sponsored network of violent gangs and corrupt soldiers. This gold buys Maduro a lavish lifestyle, it buys the military's loyalty to Maduro, and is one of the few remaining means for Venezuela to buy foreign exchange. It doesn't do anything for the ordinary Venezuelans. The largest telecoms company in Venezuela, CanTV, once nationalized, quadrupled its payroll, and raised wages. Sounds a bit like ESCOM, doesn't it? But uh, phone lines have stopped working, and the now state-owned company slashed its investments in technology, saw many of its skilled staff depart, and lost cables and equipment to thieves and looters. The government blames right-wing saboteurs. Right, you can make up your own mind about that. Since nationalizing the electricity company, Venezuela has suffered widespread blackouts, sometimes lasting weeks at a time. More than 7.3 million people have left Venezuela since 2014. According to the UN High Commission for Refugees, this is the largest exodus in Latin America's recent history and one of the largest displacement crises in the world. This is the model that the EFF would have South Africa follow. Sure. Now, one of the in, in, in discussing the benefits of nationalization, a few things jumped out from their list. Number one, increased fiscal capacity for the state, more jobs through the local beneficiation and industrialization of mineral resources. Now, how do they get to a more reliable, prosperous fiscus? Do they here sneak in the idea that they really like profits they just don't like profits going to anyone else. Well, 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 spot, well spotted. You see, they don't like profits. And they, they, the whole document is shot through with, uh, you know, denigrating capitalist companies whose only motivation is profit and they don't care about anything else and they don't care about the people and they don't care about poverty. And, you know, it's, a, it's just profit. Um, yet, all of these state owned entities are supposed to be producing this massive surplus for the fiscus. Right, which will then be ploughed back into, and we'll get to them just now, we'll ploughed back into, you know, glorious, high quality education, housing, this and that, uh, you know, healthcare. So all of these things will be funded by the profits, the surpluses generated by the state owned companies. So they really contradict themselves because the state owned companies are also supposed to produce uh, affordable goods and services, ideally free goods and services in many cases. Right. So, you know, if, they, if they're going to produce free this and free that, it is entirely unclear why, where these surpluses are going to come from. Um, you know, and as, as a Venezuela, you see that they're not. They, these surpluses don't exist. They don't, they don't come to fruition. The GDP there fell by 75, 80 percent. 
Um, so you can say, well, you know, we're going to make all these surpluses from these state-owned companies, and therefore we'll have a strong fiscus, which will allow us to to do all these wonderful things and provide all these free services. Um, but that's a self-contradictory, self-contradictory point of view. What was your, what was the second part of your question? The interesting bit about localized beneficiation and oh, yes. localization. Yeah, this is this presumes that. South Africa would be competitive at doing these things, right? Now, um, they they cite the example of diamond mines, so diamond uh, diamond polishing and diamond cutting. Um, that used to be the province of um, Antwerp, Tel Aviv, and New York. Right? They that's you want the diamonds cut. That's where you sent your diamonds. Um, this is no longer the case. India has actually cornered that market. 80% of diamonds are now cut and polished in India. Right? The assumption that South Africa can, can compete with India um, when it pays its workers very high wages, you know, the EFF also goes on about minimum wages and so on, it pays its workers very high wages. So our cost of production will be inherently more expensive. Um, you know, the reason people don't cut diamonds in South Africa, the people Company, private companies don't set up diamond cutting facilities in South Africa is because we simply wouldn't be competitive at that. You know, and, and countries need to do what they are competitive at, what they're good at. Um, you know, we are good at a few things. Uh, we're good at agriculture. We're good at mining. Um, you know, we, we can probably find some industrial and manufacturing niches where we're good at that, that we can exploit. But it makes no sense for a, for a country to start getting involved in, in areas of the economy where it is not good at, and where it is not internationally competitive. Um, and that will, will go into the protectionism argument later, because I will mm. then, oh, well, then we'll just you know, make the economy more protection, protect these industries. Um, but that doesn't help anyone. And frankly, it makes everything more expensive for all South Africans, which ultimately makes South Africans poorer. So what's interesting to me about the first and second pillars, um, it seems to me that they set up the capital required in theory, the fiscal capacity required for the third pillar to be built, this state capacity and government capacity to you know, abolish tenders, and it envisions this really Rolls-Royce version of a state. But listening to you now and, and understanding that the the the, the mythological fiscal wealth um, that should flow from trade but is hampered by uh, protectionism that should flow from you know really high paying jobs but really really cheap products in this nationalized manufacturing machine this does seem to cut through to the fact that uh, building this state capacity would need resources that simply seem not to be there. Correct. Again, the fiscus the fiscus will be will be broke um, under the under the uh, the EFF's proposals, um, which means that the idea that you know we, we're going to build the state that is capable of doing this and that and, and, and you know is honest and and efficient and produces quality stuff and employs people at high wages. Yeah, you know, that's just a wish list. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's got absolutely no foundation in economic reality. Um, you know, and, and that's a problem with a lot a lot of these a lot of these proposals of the EFFs. Um, a major element of the the state capacity and the government capacity proposal is to greatly expand the size and scope of government, and then to insource much or most of what it currently contracts out via tenders. In fact, they talk about abolishing tenders altogether. Yeah. But um, I'm not convinced that this will abolish tenders whatsoever. You know, if the, if the EFF wants to insource most of the work that government currently puts out to tender, believing that this would reduce corruption because of, uh, you know, uh, reduced tenders, in reality, it would simply move the locus of tenders further away. You know, so instead of contracting someone to build a building, which is what the government would do now, um, a government build team would exist, so the government would employ the builders, um, and then the government would simply set its, its building department to go and build a building. But they would still have to issue tenders for the suppliers of building materials. 
you know, mm. unless you say, well, the government need, they needs to they needs to to also control the manufacture uh, and supply of building materials. You know, so unless you literally have the government control the entire economy and you create an entirely autark autarkic economy that is uh, limited to South Africa, um, it is simply not possible to do away with government tenders. Um, so, so that that is a pipe dream. Um, in this list of companies that it wants to, as it were, these, these capacities that it wants to insource, we're looking at a state construction, housing construction company, roads construction company, cement, pharmaceutical, mining, food stocking. Now, um, how do they envision these entities? Do they address at all the possibility that these entities, many of them, some of them, have existed in recent history, do exist in current history, do they analyze why there are failures in, for example, state-owned housing, roads, cement, and mining companies across the world? Um, no, they don't really. They don't, they don't explain why the current systems are not working, um, and, and they don't explain why state-controlled alternatives would work better, you know? Um, I mean, a larger government is not more immune to corruption. Um, it is not more motivated and inspired to deliver high quality public services efficiently. Uh, and and the, the big problem with extending the state into almost every industry is that unlike the private sector, which is motivated by profit and by competition uh, to improve quality and to reduce prices, the government has no such motive. You know, it will... You know, and he can say, well, it is going to deliver quality and, and, and reduce and, and low prices, but it wouldn't even be able to tell whether its in-house solutions are the most effective and efficient it could possibly deploy, because it would have nothing to benchmark it against, you know, if the state monopolizes these, these businesses. Um, experience strongly suggests worldwide, no matter what the, the overarching governing philosophy of a country might be, that the service provision of the civil service lags far, far behind the service provision of the private sector. Um, the EFF talks of a motiva motivated and inspired public service. But what is there to motivate and inspire it? I mean, in the private sector, profit motivates and inspires people to work hard, to minimize mistakes, to meet deadlines and to satisfy customers. But in the public sector, the generous paycheck is guaranteed. Why would a public servant care about the quality of the service that they perform? Why would they want to be innovative uh, to improve the service that they perform? Um, motivation is really at the core of the distinction between the public and private sector. And I think that is something that the EFF doesn't understand. I was struck by uh, two specific sentences, um, well, three actually, in, in your report. Let me, and let me quote. You can either spend your own money or you can spend someone else's money. And you can either spend money for your own benefit or for the benefit of someone else. This produces four possible outcomes. Could you perhaps take us through those outcomes and how they relate to this EFF Rolls-Royce state machine of myth? Yeah, this this is, actually speaks to the next pillar as well, the the free services, which um, where this this grand state is going to produce this all encompassing state is going to produce free education, free healthcare, free houses, free sanitation. Um, they will not only be free, but they will also be high quality. Um, it is an idealistic and very expensive wish list. Um, it's of course familiar to anyone who's had some exposure to socialist promises. Um, But uh, Milton Rose Friedman um, explained once how quality and price interact depending on who buys things and for whom. As you said, you can either spend your own money or you can spend the money of someone else. You can either spend money for your own benefit or for the benefit of someone else, which produces these four outcomes. If you spend your own money on yourself, you will be motivated to maximize quality and minimize cost. Right? This is what most of us do when we go shopping. If you spend your own money for someone else's benefit, right, quality isn't going to matter so much, right? But minimizing cost will. 
Um, imagine, for example, a landlord making repairs for a tenant. Right? They tend to they tend to cut costs more than ensure quality. If you spend someone else's money for your own benefit, well, then you only care about quality, not about cost. Right? If your company pays for your lunches and your business class airplane seats, well, you know, that's fine. You only care about the quality of what you get. Um, the company pays for it, so why would you care? And finally, if you spend someone else's money for someone else's benefit, you have no incentive to care about either quality or cost. And this is where the government enters. enters the government falls into this fourth category. Um, if we make the government responsible for everything we need, then the government might claim to deliver high quality at a low price, but it has no incentive to follow through on that claim. You know, why would they care? Um, if we rely on the government, we, we will very likely end up with expensive but poor quality products and services. Um, we we'll call it Friedman's principle. You know, and I mean, history shows it to us. You know, with the, the, the EFF says that. Um, you know, the government should wield almost dictatorial control over the private sector and establish this fleet of new state-owned enterprises. As if the present fleet of state-owned enterprises that are supposed to be providing all these, all these products and services are not warning enough against doing so. Where's our high-quality uh, affordable postal system? You know, where's our high-quality electricity uh, delivery? Where's our high-quality water delivery? Just over the hill from me, there's people that have been without water for three weeks. Uh, they, there's no budget, the municipality has no budget for diesel, right? so there aren't even water trucks being sent to these areas. Right? The rest of the residents are now clubbing in to carry five litre jugs of water to these poor people. Um, and this is what, and this is uh, an EFF coalition government we have in our municipality. You know, this, is, this is where it leads. We have plenty of evidence that this doesn't work um, and that, that expecting the government to do this, you will not get quality or low cost. So then moving on to pillar five, um, the massive, uh, the, the, the protection of industrial development to create these millions of sustainable jobs and uh, high minimum wage levels to close the gap between the rich and the poor. Um, what do they then base that on? We understand the objective. As you say in your paper and in your introductory remarks, many of these concerns are, f are fair. We want more secure jobs for people and we want jobs that pay as well as is affordable and effective within an economy. So these aren't bad objectives. What do they propose to get to this point um, to, to have both this booming economy with strategic sectors being under government control, the skills pipeline of education flowing through the government control, then we sort of revert back to an economic argument saying that these um, industries must now be protected. Protected from what? Well, protected from the obvious thing that they're going to be terrible. Um... You know, this is this is another contradiction in the EFF's political philosophy, really, that they're going to build this grand, you know, state controlled system that is going to produce all these high quality and, and low cost goods. You know, they sound almost like Nikita Khrushchev. Um, but then they're going to have to be protected because, well, frankly, they're not going to be quite as good as what other countries can do. Um, so you're going to have these, this massive protected industrial development because um, it's not just about protectionism. It's also about industrial development plans, um, you know, pretty much along the lines of the Soviet five-year plans. So the, the failures of state-led industrial planning are legion. You know, you can find them in the Soviet Union, China, Brazil, India, Argentina, Sri Lanka, uh, and I've documented each of these in the, in the paper. Um, Protectionism has been tried many times. It's been found wanting. Um, you know, no doubt the EFF will say it can make it work this time, but as classical liberals, we really ought to reject that claim out of hand because there is no evidence for it. Besides dampening trade and making international trade more expensive, protectionism fails because of the economic calculation problem. Um, and the same goes for industrial development plans, by the way. Um, back in 1920, uh, famed economist Ludwig von Mises recognized that uh, central planning would fail, and he also recognized why it would fail. He published 
um, a paper called Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, an idea on which later economists like Nobel Prize winning Friedrich Hayek would expand. The economic calculation problem or the knowledge problem reflects the practical impossibility of any centralized agent of commanding all the dispersed and decentralized knowledge needed to efficiently allocate resources and control production. Right? That this knowledge about supply and demand is widely dispersed makes it an extremely complex problem. That much of this knowledge is also subjective, since the government cannot know whether you would rather have a television or a holiday, or a piece of steak or a vegetable soup, makes the problem totally intractable. You know? So this is not a problem that can be solved with fancy computers and AI, you know, that uh, yeah. a lot of modern Marxists think so, that it was just a complex problem that you know, can be solved with, with greater computational power. It is an intractable problem. It is not a solvable problem, because the government can never know what people actually want and what people prefer. Um, if you prefer a holiday, what kind of holiday do you prefer? You know, do you want to go to some timeshare and group effort you know, on a cruise with, you know, let, you know, entertainment and all of that? Or do you want to go to the bush? Do you want to go to do, do your own thing? Um, the government just doesn't know that. So to plan an industrial economy on the basis of assumptions of what people want and what people and what, what will be in demand, um, it's just not a solvable problem. Grand industrial policy plans like the EFF lays out, they rarely succeed. There are some exceptions, though, and let's be fair here. Right? They will point to South Korea, uh, to Singapore, to China, right? and say, oh, but it worked over there. Right? In none of those countries did the state first assume ownership of the commanding heights of the economy and then plan the economy on behalf of the people as a whole. On the contrary, what they did the successful state-led industrial policy plans, um, they are few and far between, but the ones that did succeed have relied heavily on opening up markets, permitting free enterprise, and attracting private sector investments. Right? All of these examples succeeded only in as far as they adopted free market capitalism and encouraged the free flow of capital, labor, and trade. Now, against the EFF's protectionist self-sufficient industrial policy stands the IRR's free enterprise and open trade. Against the EFF's punishing race-based affirmative action stands the IRR's incentivizing strategy of economic empowerment for the disadvantage. Um, mm. This is why following the um, would really be a far, a far more certain way of achieving the, the very laudable objectives that the, that the EFF has. Then going on to the last two pillars, um, the development of an African economy and advocating for a move from reconciliation to justice. I think that they, they, they sort of cheat there because I, I, I see two pillars. Having set up this massively, uh, well, let's, let's seed the possibility, having seeded or having set up this insular, highly productive, high paying, low cost economy, they move on to pillar six to suddenly start to become pro-Africa continentalists. Um, so do, do they just shift the borders of their protection suddenly from the borders of South Africa to encompass, you know, everything from Sierra Leone to Somalia and Egypt and Morocco? What happens there that they suddenly pivot from this insular economy to the great African economy? It's well, you know, they're pan-Africanist in nature. Um, in, in their beliefs. Um, I, I didn't actually go into how hypocritical this is because <laughs> you know, they, they're decolonialists on the one hand and on the other hand, they want to send South Africa state-owned entities into Africa to go and build up Africa, go and do things. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> they sound like, like would-be colonists themselves. They possibly want um, to build a railway from Cape Town to Cairo even. Yes, who who else who else wanted to do that? Uh, some <laughs> chap or Rhodes, what was his name? Yes, yeah. Um, he even he even called half of the route Rhodesia, I think. <laughs> so, look, I mean, investing in Africa and developing the African economy is again, in principle, an admirable objective, right? 
But this is based on the EFF's assumption that a large fleet of state-owned entities is going to generate vast amounts of surplus capital to invest in Africa. Right? And that is simply ill-supported. Um, it uses Transnet as an example of an organization that could not only build infrastructures through South Africa, but also, and I quote, leave massive footprints concerning skills transfer, the development of the communities where investments happen, the payment of tax, reinvestment, corporate social investment, safety standards, compliance with labor laws and regulation, and the fundamental economic development of these countries. I mean, it's going to be this, it's going to be this great beneficial, like, you know, overarching, you know, investment, well, we're, going to, we're going to lift you out of poverty. They want the same transnet to do that, that is currently broke, that asked for 100 billion and bail out and only got 47 billion, that cannot even run South Africa's ports and railways. Right? Um, it is certainly not producing any excess cash. Um, it, it is, it's, just a, it's just a pipe dream. Um, look, Africa does not suffer from a lack of investment capital. It suffers from self-inflicted constraints imposed by socialism, corruption, and violent conflict. If the triple curse of socialism, corruption, and war can be lifted from the African continent, it would absolutely thrive. It doesn't need the EFF. Mm. Now, I must say, I, this, this uh, ideali um, idealization of, of, of Transnet's footprint, um, it, I, I wonder which period of Transnet's existence do they seek to emulate, because it certainly doesn't seem to be any recent period. And the failure of these SOEs lead us on to pillar seven as a good segue, open, accountable, corruption-free government and society, then with an interesting flavor, I think, without fear of victimization by state agencies. Um, un unpack that for us and, and, and indulge me in explaining for us how the victimization by state agencies might be a bit of a misnomer here. Well, I mean, it's uh, that last part, the victim, you know, free from the victimization of state agencies. I mean, if, you're gonna, if you hand the state great amounts of control, great amounts of power, right, um, how many things have been written over the years? It says power corrupts. Great power corrupts, absolutely. Um, you know, it, this is like saying, yeah, well, you know, the, the, the Soviet government was worked for the benefit of the people. The, you know, the East German Stasi worked for the benefit of the people. It wasn't victimizing anyone. You, know, you can say that, but that's not how it's going to happen. If you give a bunch of people ultimate control over the lives and the economy of, of everyone else, right, it is going to get abused. People are going to get victimized. Um, Look, the ideal of open, accountable, and corrupt free government is, is of course, marvelous. Right? And um, we at the IRR certainly agree that that is a great objective. Um, its primary objective, which it wrote at the time, was the disclosure of donations to political parties. That has now already been achieved. Um, what that revealed wasn't grand corruption. It wasn't great international plots to overthrow the government or anything. All it really revealed was that... Um, the EFF itself is funded by big business, right? which I thought was rather ironic. Um, the EFF's proposals to limit political interference in the operation of state entities, while laudable, do not promise to be very effective. It entirely neglects to outline a credible strategy to actually limit and prosecute corruption in the government. So it says we're going to do it, doesn't say how. Um, Look, there's a litany of socialist countries, especially in Latin America and uh, in Africa, that, that follow largely the, the EFF's economic plans. And they've degenerated into cesspits of corruption in which a small, wealthy elite rules over an impoverished population. Um, this is what socialism does. This is what the EFF's economic doctrine does. The more power a government has, the more power there is to corrupt. So by concentrating all power in the state, the EFF will create a potential monster against which citizens have no protection. I think that is definitely the ominous conclusion is that we won't have to worry about state capture 
because the capture would be so complete, it wouldn't need to be captured any further. Exactly. So pivoting to perhaps back to the, the um, noble ideals of alleviating poverty, of addressing the very real socioeconomic legacy of the last 100 years, 50 years of those under apartheid, and definitely the last 30 years that have not seen the sustained improvements, except perhaps for a, a brief decade between 96 and 2007. What other options are there to deal seriously with these very real issues? Is it possible to meet the outcomes set up as the sort of preamble of the AMC's, uh, the, pardon me, a Freudian slip on my side, of the EFF's seven economic pillars? Um, well, it is, it is possible to achieve these objectives. Um, I think one of, the, one of the important things here is to disabuse people of the notion that what we've seen so far um, in the economic development of South Africa um, has been free market capitalism. Right, and therefore, that the failures that we've seen in South Africa are somehow the fault of free market capitalism. You know, the EFF will tell you that capitalism needs to be overthrown, and that it's all capitalism's fault. Uh, they will also tell you that capitalism was the doctrine of the, of the apartheid government. Um, that was, it was superficially true in the 80s when, when Reagan was in power in the US and Thatcher was in power in the UK. And the uh, the apartheid government had to look good in their eyes. Um, they, they sort of made some capitalist overtures, but if you really analyze the, the apartheid government's uh, economic policy, it was, it was very heavy on state control, state interference in markets. They had these collective marketing boards uh, for agricultural products. They, they controlled prices in many sectors. They operated the civil service as basically a sponge in which to employ um, white people who weren't otherwise employable. <coughs> I remember when I was at school, you know, if you didn't do well in school, didn't go to varsity or go to college or whatever, um, you could always fall back on a job in the police or as a nurse or as a teacher or in the railways if you were really poor. Um, you know, there was always, there was, the state would always catch you somehow. Um, and, and find a reserved job, of course, which was not open to black people, um, in, order, in order to produce. This is, this, is, this is a very socialistic idea, you know, that the government is going to provide you a job if the private sector can't, um, that the government will look after everyone in society. The apartheid government only looked after the white people, but the principles were pretty much the same. It was a nationalism, it was socialism. Um, and that's what the ANC has been running under as well, nationalism and socialism. Um, in fact, the, the ANC's goal, the NDR, is socialist revolution. And they make no bones about that. It's, it's, it exists in public documents. So, uh, just the other day in Sona, uh, Ramaphosa again mentioned we, you know, our national democratic society, which is a reference to the national democratic revolution. This is a socialist ideal. So the idea that capitalism has somehow failed um, is, is wrong. What has failed is, is crony capitalism. And that's a very different thing, state capitalism, if you like. Um, I don't even like to call it capitalism because it, that, that sort of misdirects. It's, what, it, it's, it's certainly not a free market. Right? Mm. The, the very close relationship between business and government right, mm. has been toxic in South Africa um, and is a big reason why many of the development projects, many of, of you know, South Africa's growth potential and so on hasn't been achieved. Um, which is why if you, if you go to the, the, the RR growth strategy, you know, the, what, what it focuses on very strongly is the development not of um, a big business relationship with government, but a, a development of free markets in which government's role is minimized. The interface between government and business is minimized. Um, and, and, you know, these thousands of, of free um, competitors, small business and so on, are, are let loose and, and allowed to thrive and allowed to create jobs. That's ultimately where, where you know, our, 
how the solution to our problems are going to come from. We've seen it demonstrated in this country already that under mm -hmm. Becky we had a few years of 5% growth. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think 5% was enough. At the time, I thought we should be able to grow at 10%. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was critical of Mbeki even then. Um, but it did show 5% growth was enough to steadily decrease unemployment. Mm -hmm. You know, and it fell, it fell to below 20% at one point and was on its way down when suddenly everything changed. And, uh, you know, the, our, our growth flatlined. You know, we not, not only did we have a financial... Uh, the global financial crisis. We never recovered from the global financial crisis, yeah. thanks to state capture. And because we haven't had any growth since then, or at least no growth that exceeded our population growth, uh, that's why unemployment has risen again. So there's a very mm. strong link between things like unemployment, problems like unemployment and poverty and economic growth. And what mm. we need are policies that create and nurture economic growth um, in the private sector. Right. The, 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 state, the state can't produce economic growth. Right? The SOEs haven't been able to produce profits. You know, the, the state cannot produce it. Um, mm. The private sector can, and that is what we need to nurture. I, I, I fully agree, and I must say, the, I think it was the late, great John K. Berman who said that corporate South Africa has never met a government it doesn't like, in the sense exactly. that this isn't about growth for the sake of an enriched elite few. This is free markets to unleash the capacity of individuals to become problem solvers and people in a position to pay them for that problem solving. It's much more fundamental and grassroots no. than something as obscure as capitalism or crony capitalism. It is just, do we think people have the basic dignity and the basic talent to solve problems and get paid money for their troubles? Yes. You're right. It's it, it's got a lot to do with dignity. You know, the the EFF seems to think that dignity is about your material conditions, and if you are somehow provided with, you know, the basics of of uh, you know living, electricity, water, food, uh, roof over your head, uh, some clothes, that that will confer upon you dignity. Uh, but it doesn't. You know, if all of that is given to you by the state. You know, if, if everyone becomes a ward of the state in that sense, that doesn't confer dignity. Hell, it doesn't even confer adulthood. Um, mm. this, is, this is how children are treated. You know, mm. children get these things for free. Um, mm. And then we grow up and we want to produce things for ourselves and we want to build our own lives and, 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 and create our own lives. And that's, you know, so the, the whole notion of, of this, this massive state control of the economy it's a very patronizing, um, mm. patriarchal notion in which, mm. the, in which the citizen is almost infantilized and, and basically assumed to be incapable of solving their own problems and providing for themselves. Um, I, I think it's a very nasty ideology mm. in that sense. We have a, a, one of the questions um, we have here in the chat is this idea that to the ordinary South African, this utopian promise of the EFF uh, sounds wonderful, feasible. Um, in your research for this paper, did you find that the EFF here has the basis for mass support um, in a democratic way where people will just go, what the EFF is selling, I'm willing to buy? Well, this is, I think this is a problem worldwide. Um, socialists have a very appealing message uh, that is often believed by people who do not understand economics themselves. Um, and to be fair, that's a lot of, that's a lot of people. Uh, even educated people don't understand economics very often. Um, so, I mean, this is one of the reasons I, I wrote this paper. I thought, well, let's go, yeah, go look at the detailed proposals and explain in detail why these proposals are not achievable, right? And why they won't work? Um, because without doing that, if you if you let them stand unchallenged, then people are going to look at this and say, "Well, you know, this sounds great. This sounds we can have all these wonderful things, and you know, we're going to have this this great country we can be proud of." Um, 
you know, okay, we'll go to schools where we're indoctrinated with patriotism and, and, and loyalty and, you know, all these, all these things. Uh, that's actually also in the EFF uh, document. Uh, we're all going to have, you know, it's like re-education camps for our, for our kids. Um, you know, but, but ultimately everyone will have what their heart desires and they'll have quality mm -hmm. products at affordable prices and everyone will have a nice income. Um, so it, 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 the promises sound lovely. You know, mm. So the EFF says it can produce them. Well, if, some, if someone doesn't counteract that, if someone doesn't gainsay them, then, yeah, you're going to have a lot of people that believe that. Um, I'm hoping that, that, you know, at least a small part of the EFF um, support base might read something like this and say, well, actually, no, um, it's not going to work. Or that some of the ideas maybe appear in, in, in papers, you know. Mm. So this is why the EFF's, policy frameworks won't work why the mm. why these promises won't happen you know the eff isn't santa claus um yes you know, socialists Despite socialists aren't way. santa claus you know socialists aren't santa claus they can't they can't deliver on these promises and they don't deliver on these promises anywhere else you know yeah. anywhere where socialism has been tried um it's failed right so what I think is very useful about this session, and, and thank you for your time today with this webinar and also this excellent paper, which I would urge everyone to go and read, is that this is where it starts. We're, we're not expecting to go directly. We, we can't commission you to gate crash every bri or social event in this country and go stand next to the water cooler and say this. But we can, as a think tank, start the chain reaction of ideas permeating and for that i think papers like this that take the subject matter seriously really build a credibility for political discussion and consideration that boils down to what do we need in south africa and what's the way to get to it and an interesting note from the ir's most recent polling data that we published last year november was that most south africans believe in what we might call the moderate middle, non-racialism, the yeah. basic essentials of a participation in a free market economy, the appointment of people on merit, even these toxic, dangerous ideas of school vouchers and education vouchers that put the resources of the state at the disposal of the individual to achieve that choice, to achieve that dignity. So the ground, as it were, is fertile and as a parting question, perhaps to you, Ivo, what do you see as the next step for pursuing this uh, this argument, this engagement, and are you positive or negative about whether this argument can go the distance? Well, I think the first step is is you know I, I often get accused of this myself that that you know we just look at the EFF and we say oh they're, they're socialists they're wrong. End of story. I'm sorry, but that is not a convincing argument, you know. Um, and that is why I went to some length to actually listen to the exposition of what their policies are, what their ideas are, and how they propose to achieve them, uh, and then answer them on 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 those terms, uh, you know, in some just take them seriously and and analyze them on those terms. Um, because I think if we don't do that, then we will say, why, how, how would we change minds? You know, if, um, because the answer to, oh, that socialist, that'll never work, is just, well, I'm a socialist and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, <laughs> um, it needs, these, these points need to be argued. And I think they need to be in the public debate and then they need to be argued in the media and, and on television. And, um, it's only once these ideas are, are challenged that you have some chance of actually fighting them um, and, and actually having some impact, perhaps, on, on voting patterns in the country. You know, that people realize that voting EFF isn't going to solve the problems that they now have with the ANC. Um, in fact, it's going to make things worse. Ivo, I want to thank you very much, not just for today, but for this paper. I mean, you definitely drew my attention to the fact that my reading of the EFF uh, might have quite often been shallow. And I think uh, that is definitely the, the, the positive type of development we want. 
Um, on that note, I would urge everyone in the audience to go read this paper. It is available on the IRR's website and keep an eye out for future publications. We spoke today about the real challenges in South Africa and there are solutions. The IRR is working on them, on promoting them, and we are publishing this year a series of papers that we call the Blueprint for Growth, where we look at the very real aspirations of people who might sympathize with the EFS mission, but we provide solutions that not only preserve liberty and preserve the necessary foundations of what it means to live in a constitutional liberal democracy, but also delivers the prosperity, the economic growth that ultimately is the path to human dignity. Ivo, I thank you and I thank the audience for joining us today. We will definitely see you again. All the very best. Thanks, Herman.